Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of Building from Ground Up. My name is Koro Manekoroye. I am the moderator for today's session, and I am Tech About Managing Editor and Acting Editor-in-Chief. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Today, we're going to be speaking to Area Derinoko, and we're really excited for today's conversation. Area is um, the co-founder, COO, and by VP uh, of engineering at Helicaria, and we're really excited to have her here. Um, I just want to quickly run through our agenda for the morning, and then I'm going to bring up some people to speak. Um, uh, building from just a brief intro about building from ground up, building from ground up, the series powered by the UK Nigeria Tech Hub, and Tech About is just an implementing partner. So thank you to the UK Nigeria UK Nigeria Tech Hub team for putting this together. Um, and then we're going to first hear from Carolina Oaks. She is um, the Tech Hub Networking Manager um, in the Department for Digital Culture, Media, and Sport. And then we're going to um, have Eric come up and give a brief intro before we get into the conversation. Just a little, before um, Carolina, Carolina speaks actually, just a, a bit more information about um, the Building from Ground Up series. The Building from Ground Up series seeks to bring together founders across the Nigeria and UK tech ecosystems. And we bring these founders together to share their stories of building and scaling, as well as useful, instructive insights for founders and aspiring founders. So if you're a founder on this, on this call or you're thinking about one day setting up your own business, startup, uh, or whatever it is, then this series just really brings the brightest mind um, operating in our ecosystem and they share tips, they share insights, they share the experiences and it's a great way to basically learn from, from people who have been in the game for a bit longer. Um, in our last episode, we spoke to Chi Chi, who is the founder of Ascenti. Um, that video session will be will soon be available, but you can catch up on our ed other episodes. We've had Tito Ovia, who is co-founder at Helium Health, um, Femi Adeyomo, who is Adeyomo, who is founder and CEO of Energy. We've had Otochek CEO as well. We've had a couple of other great founders and operators on Building from Ground Up, and those episodes are available. You can go on our website to find them. Now I'd like to invite the Tech Hub Network Manager at the Department for Digital Culture, Media, and Sports, Carolina Oaks, to tell us more about the Hub. So Carolina, over to you. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, my name is Carolina, I'm from um, calling in from London and I'm based at the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sports here in the UK. Um, and I am a TechnoHub Network Manager, which means that I uh, work very closely with the team out in Nigeria, um, working um, at the UK Nigeria Tech Hub. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit more about um, what the Tech Hub does and our work. Essentially, um, we are aimed at sort of um, addressing three different issues that all come together. First of those is um, making sure that we are fostering digital skills um, in the Nigerian economy. So working on projects that um, uh, foster lots of different um, digital skills within the, the ecosystem. For example, um, we are just having a graduation ceremony right um, at this minute, I think, um, for our de design product and developer school. Um, we also are really um, keen to be um, supporting tech entrepreneurship in Nigeria as well um, and ensuring that we're building capacity within the ecosystem and this series um, is part of that sort of pillar of our work. Um, we work with um, angel investors um, to uh, build their skills up um, as well as um, we have another um, project that runs across our network of hubs um, called the Future Females Business School. Um, which builds capacity for um, female entrepreneurs um, and who are looking to do sort of tech, mainly tech for good um, startups. We also work in influencing startup policy. Um, for example, we've been working quite closely on the Startup Act in Nigeria as well. Um, and also we are wanting to foster more connections with the UK and um, between the UK and Nigeria um, in, in the startup ecosystem in particular. Um, I hope that gives a decent overview of um, what we um, what we do. 
Um, and um, we're really excited to be hosting this series of talks um, at the um, for the Building from the Ground Up series. I think um, uh, from personal experience, and um, I think a lot of people can um, relate to the fact that listening to an inspiring talk um, that is really helpful and where someone's really sharing their wisdom and their experience and their insights um, is a really great way to um, motivate yourself but also to um, learn and um, get firsthand some proper advice so really excited to be hearing this talk today um, and uh, be hearing a bit more about how um, we can be growing a business um, in this more virtual world that we're living in. So thank you so much um, for having me to introduce the talk um, and thank you. No problem. Thanks for speaking with us. Okay, so on to the main show. So Iri Adirinoko is a self-taught front-end developer and user interface designer from Lagos, Nigeria. She is also the co-founder, CEO, and VP of engineering uh, at Helicaria, which is a YC 2018 company, um, summer 2018. And Helicaria is a company building cryptocurrency infrastructure for Africa. Helicaria is behind products such as Bitcoins, which a lot of us are familiar with, Sencash, Sencash Pay, and more. In addition, Ere is a Google expert, specializing in the core front-end technologies such as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but is passionate about all aspects of technology. She has written over 100 articles on this topic. I haven't even written over 100 articles on this that I know, and I'm a writer. <laughs> I'm very concerned. Um, and she has a great blog. I'm actually going to pop that into the chat box. And she actually does share a lot of what she knows and because she's self-taught and she's in, she started like really young she knows a lot of information and i'm hoping that we get to hear um some of that as it pertains to building and managing distributed teams um when a company is going through its growth stage so Eric, thank you so much um you can unmute your mic and say hello <laughs> Hi, <laughs> thank you for the amazing introduction. I feel very like accomplished, <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks. I feel like I don't have anything to add to that. That was like a great introduction, but yeah, I'm excited to be here. And uh, yeah, that's my blog in the chat. Um, it's about front end um, development, but yeah, like I'm excited for us to get started. I'm sorry about the lighting. Okay. It's like slowly, the sun is slowly I, moving I, in this direction. Like on one side. <laughs> so I'm trying to scoot here, but then it keeps catching up with me. <laughs> <laughs> but we can see you clearly we can see and hear you okay clearly. good um, so we'll just yeah even me my background my shadows are shifting okay so let's get right in so i actually want to start off with you just sharing a little bit about your 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 background like when you started what, what was your early early interest in software engineering in building in coding anything really related to what you do now can you just walk us through sort of how you came into this sector and then we'll take it from there Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, like you mentioned, I started web development like as a teenager. Um, it was, I was like introduced to it through this online game I used to play that sort of taught you some like very basic HTML and CSS. And you were actually there. So, I don't know if I'd have to say that you were actually physically present. <laughs> no, you when can't I was, like, no, you can't actually say, sorry, they can't know, they can't know about us like that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was just like some random thing that I was doing and it wasn't anything that I really thought was something that I could make a career out of. It was just, like I said, it was part of the game. So it was literally just like playing to me. <laughs> so it wasn't really until, you know, like um, I went to, I mean, I even when I went to university, I ended up studying psychology for my undergraduate and then I studied law for my master's. So I was still very like, it wasn't something in the realm of, oh, this is something I can do as a career. It was literally just like a side hobby. But it was only like, you know, after all of that, that I actually um, discovered that, oh, people actually can make a career out of this. And since it was something I was just interested in for such a long time, I felt like it really made sense for me to at least give it a try. So I once I like graduated from my master's, I really just gave myself, I gave myself about like a year to see if I could at least like do something. And I obviously had like a lot to fall back on if it didn't work out, but luckily it did work out. So I didn't have to actually end up being a lawyer. <laughs> but um, yeah, so like, I mean, early on I worked um, at, well, Bikabal actually, which was like my first real job. 
And um, then I worked like at a company based in Germany um, that builds like ad block software. So I was building websites with them. But then after that, like it's, I started working on what back then, which was called Bitcoin Africa, but then became Bycoins. Um, just sort of like as a side project, another kind of fun thing to work on. And it just sort of grew as we started to understand like the real potential for it. And then we, you know, applied and got into YC and it became like a whole lot more real from there. Really cool. And it's great to actually have a BCM alumna on the call um, because we're just celebrating, um, you know, people what help the company get to where it is now. So that's always really exciting. Uh, so I want to talk about, so obviously you mentioned studying psychology and then you talk about studying law, right? And these are two, I, I would say, programs or degrees that require a lot of your time. How are you able to manage um, your like actually working on your what and what is now a professional interest but started off as just a passionate interest. Um, how are you able to manage school, both in your bachelor's and your master's, and also manage teaching yourself and then eventually like becoming a professional at what you do? How are you able to balance both? Yeah, so I mean, before I got into my master's, it was still just something I did like I said, very much just as a hobby. I still wasn't, I still hadn't decided to take it seriously yet. So it wasn't really an issue prior to my master's um, to try and juggle both. It was only like during my master's that I actually then, you know, rediscovered it more seriously. And then I now decided that I actually wanted to take it um, seriously. So as soon as I graduate, I'm going to try and work on this full time. So that was obviously a lot more difficult, particularly because like a master's in law was obviously very um, time intensive. So I really had to manage my time very well. And what ended up happening was that most of the time I would only really work on this stuff during like when I had breaks, because otherwise I wouldn't really have the time to do it during the actual term. So it was really like, okay, when I'm on summer holiday or when I'm on like Christmas holiday is when I would then um, try and do like one short course here or there, or just like try and work on this or work on that. But um, yeah, it was definitely difficult to try and manage while I was like at school. Um, I just okay. realized I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it sounds like there was a lot of time management that went into balancing both school and then also learning um, everything that kind of helped you get to this point right now. Um, so let's talk about Bitcoin Africa, right? And Bitcoin Africa was launched in 2017, correct? Um, that's what we have in our information about you. Yeah, so 2017, right? That is, I mean, it's five years ago and the ecosystem was in a completely different place at that time, right? I would even say that that's when a number of Nigerian-based tech companies were beginning to find their footing. Um, at that time, I was at Flutterway. That was like a year after I joined Flutterway. So I know that that, that ecosystem at that time was, was just charging up, right? So when you think back to building Bitcoin Africa, right? Can you talk to us about like what led you to say, okay, you know what, I want to start a company like this, or I want to build a product um, like Bitcoin Africa. And then can you also talk to us about like the journey from Bitcoin Africa to Bitcoin before we even get to Heli Carrier Studio? Mm. Yes. Yeah, so like I said, in initially it was very much like this is something that we can work on and it's something that we can build like bitcoin africa so um like myself and my co-founder built the first version and it was um like it was something that we saw that was achievable and because we had the capabilities to do it it made sense for us to at least like give it a try right because it wasn't going to cost us anything besides our time really so that's kind of what um, the like, you know, approach that we took at that point. But then once we then got into um, YC or when we, when we were applying for YC was when we actually had to like properly make the decision about how seriously we want to take this. So the first time that we applied, which was like the day that we launched, um, we didn't get into the program at that point, but we got some good feedback that, okay, this is you know, something that they're interested in and, you know, they kind of like us as well. But one of the things that they also flagged was like, okay, well, how seriously are you willing to take this? Like, are you actually ready to 
fully focus on this because at the time I was working with um, a com the company in Germany and I was even actually like thinking, oh, my next step would be to try to work at like a more global company like a Google or something like that. So I wasn't even, the first time we applied, I wasn't really in the mindset of, okay, I'm, really, I'm ready to drop everything to actually focus on being an entrepreneur. I felt like I, I even felt like I wasn't completely ready for it at the time. But then when we applied the second time, it was like a decision that, well, I actually needed to either fully commit to doing this or, um, or just not be a part of it. And I felt like it was sort of a once in a lifetime opportunity. So something that I felt like, okay, well, up until now, like I said, the only thing we had really spent was our time right so I felt like it was not necessarily low stakes but it was I felt like I was in a time in my life where I could actually afford to make the mistake right it's probably better to do that kind of thing earlier in your life than to wait until you're like I don't know however old and then at that point say okay let's like try and be an entrepreneur and try doing something that's extremely like risky so I just felt like, okay, this is the decision that I'm going to make. So when we went for our final like YC interview, I had to come in saying, okay, well, I had quit my other job. I was like, I'm fully focused. And um, so that was kind of like a turning point. And then for the transition into buy coins, um, that happened during YC. So one of the things they tell you is that, you know, what you come in with, the product that you come in with is not necessarily going to be the product that you leave with. And the whole process, the whole point of the process is about, you know, finding product market fit, trying to determine what exactly your product should be. So one of the things that we realized through that process was that our whole model of the way Bitcoin Africa worked, which was a lot more like peer to peer and a lot more like um, it actually like didn't fix the problem that we thought we were trying to fix. And that's something that we learned through the going through YC and then we realized, oh, we actually need to rebuild this product. And that's kind of where we transitioned into Bitcoins, which was a lot more um, of the type of product that we were trying to build with Bitcoin Africa, but not realizing that we didn't actually end up building. It's a really great response. Um, to just briefly talk about what, what it felt like applying to YC at that time. Um, because obviously that was your first time, right? And I know that when founders are getting ready to apply to YC, there's a lot of thinking that goes into it, um, a lot of careful thinking that goes into it and ensuring that you are putting your best foot forward, right? Even though all you have is an MVP, right? So what was your experience like? And um, do you find that uh, first time founders or aspiring founders who want to get into YC reach out to you or Timmy or Tommy what to just ask? Um, for advice or, you know, the best, like they ask for tips on, you know, how to put their application together and what they need to know before they even get through the front door. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the application itself um, is a lot more like, I guess, almost personal. It's very like, you know, reflecting on why you're doing this, like what you think you want to be able to achieve. So I think where we see a lot more people reaching out for help is when you get to the interview, because that's that's a lot more, um, like it can go almost any way. <laughs> like you have people yeah. that come out of the interview and you know they were asked like 10, 10 billion, <laughs> like really intense technical questions, or you come out from, and or like for our experience, right? Our interview ended up actually being a lot less, um, oh, tell us about X, Y, and Z about the business and all of that. It actually ended up being a lot more about us. So yeah. it can really range a lot. And I think that's the, um, because it's so, I don't know what the percentage is actually for like how many people do an interview versus how many people um, actually get it but it's one of those things that's a lot more high stakes because it feels like oh yeah so close but it's just this one very mm -hmm. short thing that might determine everything um so that is something that we get a lot more um people wanting advice around and we you know try and do whatever we can when we have the time to like help people and but I think that advice that we usually give is obviously you know 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 your product know what you're doing but yeah. um it's 
I think it's a lot also about the impression that you leave and the confidence that you bring. So that's something that, um, you know, I always try and tell people. Thank you. Okay, so back in 2017, I mean, it was just you, Timmy, and Tommy were trying to figure things out, trying to figure Bitcoin out and then eventually buy coins, right? Um, and then obviously have your, your early employees, as you like to call them. How much has the team grown since then, especially with SendCash, SendCash Pay being introduced? And I know that um, when Timmy hosted the, um, the event with uh, technical founders, or CTOs, you know, I know that he announced that there were some new things that were coming to Helicarrier Studio, right? So how much has the team grown since then? And can you tell us how distributed your employees are currently? Mm. Yeah, so I mean, now we're a team of about 50. And I would say the way that we've grown is maybe from the first year or two, we like grew to maybe like 10 or something max. And it's more so... 2020 and 2021 that we actually grew a whole lot more which is kind of ironic because that was like the pandemic <laughs> so it feels mm -hmm. like it should have been like the other way around but actually that was the point at which we actually grew a whole lot more um sorry what was the second question um the second question was how distributed are your employees oh yes yes so most people are in nigeria most people are even in lagos okay. i would say like maybe 80 to 90 percent of people are in Lagos um there's some other people like outside of Lagos still in Nigeria and we'll say we have like a handful of people in other places but most of it is still like so Ghana Kenya like I'm in the UK um so it's mostly still in that same like area um and you know one of our co-founders goes back and forth between the U.S. so he's the one that probably um has like more of a drastic change in time zone at times okay okay um 50 that's a i think that that's a really nice number because you're not too small but you're not too big right um so talk to me mm. about how you um how you and your co-founders sort of manage um meetings um productivity especially mm. when you're in different locations right um are there specific days where you dedicate to connecting with your team your team members in Lagos mm. versus your team members like again in Kenya or in Ghana, right? What does that look like? And and what challenges have you experienced since you started mm. your team started to grow? Mm. Yeah, I think it's a problem that we haven't faced significantly yet because like I said, we are all mostly in the same time zone. Um, and the way we work is that, you know, the Lagos time zone is like the main time zone, right? So that's typically what we align like meetings and stuff around. So meetings will usually be within that working day. Um, but I think another thing that helps us a lot is that we have always very much been like an working in an asynchronous manner. So we don't have like a lot of meetings. We don't have a lot of like standups. We don't have a lot of like, oh, you always need to be here at this time. Like we do yeah. have a working day in the sense that like our official working time is, you know, 10 to six, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if um, somebody needed to do something in the afternoon, that's like, we're going to be like, no, you can, you have to do it outside working hours. Cause that's not really mm -hmm. how we work. We're very much about if you're, you know, achieving your targets, we don't necessarily care how you split your time. Like there are people who might just want to work for like four hours in the middle of the night. And if that's, as long as you're like still having the output that we want, like we're completely fine with that. Um, in terms of like how we actually like get things done. So I think we rely a lot on like the tools that we use. So, you know, Basecamp currently is our like main project management um tool so you know it allows us to keep track of like tasks what everyone is doing at any point of time and that also helps with um i guess building that trust because the way that we work or having this very like asynchronous working manner only really works when you are trusting that people aren't going to like take advantage of that and that's why we like to as much as possible do things out in the open so if you're doing something mm -hmm. like it is on base cam so if at any point i wanted to see oh what has this person been doing for the past week i can see exactly what they've been doing um so there's that and we do still 
we use other tools. So I think um, another one that we like to use is called Tandem, which is something like if you're available, if you're like at your computer, you can like sign into Tandem and people can just kind of ping you if they need to like quickly ask a question or do something like that. Mm. It's like a it's like a virtual workspace basically. So it's kind of like we try to have that combination between like you know when you're available be like on tandem or be on something so that people can reach out to you if they need to but generally speaking unless something is actually like super urgent which we try not to make things that way um people don't necessarily need to be at any given place at any given time yeah so i'm gonna go ahead and share this tandem link with cabal leadership (laughs) because this sounds amazing (laughs) Um, yeah, <laughs> but I but I love this, and I love what you said about um, the culture of transparency because we have that at BCM as well, where um, we don't work in silos, and it's very important that we open up documents, you know, shared with multiple teams members so people know what you're working on and they're able to assist you and I do think that a lot more startups and founders should um should kind of include that in their in their policies like you'd be transparent be open um so let's talk about hiring obviously um you know and but before we actually talk about hiring I do want to I want you to clarify something about your role right because you are both COO and VP of engineering which are two separate things right because COO mm-hmm. is largely in charge of running operations in the company or in the business but engineering is quite technical right so how are you Mm -hmm. able to I guess balance both right and switch between both hats right um when you have to focus on the engineering side of the business and then also the operation operational side of the business as well yeah I think um it's I mean it's definitely very different but I guess the way that I think about it is that I'm kind of just like managing these different teams and there we have like you know other people that might be able to um help be more involved in like the actual granular details of things but at the end of the day like I'm just kind of the one that's shaping the direction of how things are going so it doesn't feel that overwhelming I guess maybe there's a bit of a context switch sometimes in that oh I like I'm doing this one day but then somebody else needs me for something else, but I don't necessarily feel like they are actually, I mean, they are obviously different roles, but it just doesn't feel yeah. like, oh, I am like switching between different hats. It's just like maybe the actual details are different, but ultimately it's still just kind of managing different teams. And um, in terms of even like doing actual engineering, I obviously do a lot less actual engineering work, but because of the way that we actually um, assign tasks. So we work in sprints. So every like, four to six weeks, we um, set out, okay, this is what we're working on for the sprint. And we define like, okay, what the tasks are going to be. And, you know, based on how much like operation stuff I have, I might say, okay, I'm going to do less of actual engineering work, or I might decide to do more because I have like less ops work. So it's just, I guess, about finding that balance. And um, yeah, I guess, like I said, it doesn't feel so separate to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about hiring. Now, there's a lot of conversations around the fact that finding talent is so difficult now, especially finding talent within Nigeria, where a huge proportion of your team is based, and just generally in Africa, we're experiencing a brain drain and all of that, right? So can you talk to us about um, what, when it comes to hiring, how do you think about it? How do your co-founders think about it? And how, how involved are you in the process, especially Actually, now that your team is growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for us, the way we think about hiring is, I mean, we look at a person's skills, obviously, um, but they're kind of, it's kind of like two prongs. So we looked at their skills and then we also look at how they might fit into our culture because mm-hmm. we feel like our work culture is a big part of the reason that we are able to work that the way we do. Like I said, even with... Um, you know, working very asynchronously, that requires a lot of trust. So we need to only be able to hire people that we feel like we can have that trust in. So, um, so yeah, that's, I guess, like the culture aspect. But with the skills aspect, we actually like tend to focus a lot more on, um, like I'm using the word skills rather than, I guess, maybe like CV. And that's a little bit more intentional because we, I mean, we'll obviously look at your CV and it will inform things, but 
for me particularly when I'm like starting to hire like new front end engineers, like it always starts with, okay, I'm giving them a task to do to kind of see what their skills are. So we are very, we're a lot less concerned about, okay, what school did you go to? What other company did you work at? Than like, what can you actually do? And that also feeds into the culture. We're looking for the type of person that you are, not necessarily what you've done. Um, but yeah, it is definitely difficult. And um, like you said, we, you know, I think when we first started, the main issue we were facing was, okay, well, this is such a new space, particularly like blockchain, like, okay, where are we going to find people who can actually even do this to begin with? So there was, or, and there still is a lot of like training. Um, but like you also said, now we're actually almost facing the opposite in that like we're finding people who are skilled, but most or a lot of people want to then leave the country because of whatever reasons. So we are now looking at, okay, well, how can we still remain competitive even though we're like a country sort of based in Nigeria and people are trying to, you know, leave the country. And that's why we, you know, do whatever we can in terms of being as competitive as we can, especially with our um, move to paying staff using um, crypto and USDC instead of like Naira, because that is also like a big factor for people. Um, but yeah, I think I've like lost my train of thoughts, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we got, we got the gist, we got the gist. Um, and so essentially you guys apply sometimes traditional, but mostly unconventional um, processes when it comes to hiring, right? So the CV is fine, but then we also want to know that you can actually do the job and that you can fit into the culture as well. Um, and so I yeah, want to be on yeah. the podcast. And just sorry, just to even add mm -hmm. to that, like um, we've even more recently started um, implementing, doing more like trials with people. So even though, you know, we will go through an interview process, we also want to like actually work with you for a certain amount of time before mm -hmm. we actually fully commit to hiring. And that's like, I said, that's why it's, it, we really don't, we focus a lot more on like, okay, well, show up and do the work rather than you telling us you can show up and do the work. You can show up and do, I really like that. Um, it's like a, like a vetting period for both the founders and the employees as well. So yeah, both exactly. parties get to like decide, oh yes, I like working for you. No, it's not working out. Yeah. And there are no hard feelings or anything like that. Um, so I wanted to stay on the culture of um, the, the conversation of culture because as a startup grows, especially when it's moving from seed to scale up, right? Um, sometimes things get lost in translation and um, obviously, we know that there are a lot of tech startups that don't have great culture. So can you talk to us how, about how you and your founding team are able to sort of re not just maintain, but even improve upon the culture as you add more people to the team? What are some things that you guys do to ensure that, okay, we're still um, communicating respectfully, we're still being mindful of the people that we're working with? And yeah, do you have any tips to share with um, any aspiring founders on the call? Yeah, definitely. And I think this is a issue that we are almost like on the edge of facing a lot more um, gravely than we are now. Like I think at our current team size, the approach that we currently have is working, but I imagine that when we like double and we're like a hundred people, it might not necessarily work as well. We need to also like rethink how things will work as we grow even more. Mm -hmm. But I would think, I would say that a huge part of um, why we've been able to maintain th this culture is by making sure that each member of the team actually has a direct relationship with at least like two of the three of us. So um, one, one, of, one of the three of us would probably be like one of your managers, for example. So like if you're a front end engineer, I'll be like one of your managers. But we also have um, a like sort of mentorship type of thing as well, where each of the, each member of the team does like one-on-one -on -one, um, calls and just like meetings with one of the founders that they don't actually directly work with. And that's a lot more about, it's not really about, you know, what you're working on. It's more about like, okay, how, how are you feeling? Like, how are things going in the company? Like, do you have any concerns about anything? Like, what do you, what goals do you want to achieve? Like, what can we do to like improve, like how you're doing? But also about making sure that the person is 
understanding like what our vision is and understanding what our culture is. So I think having that relationship with the three of us really helps. And like I said, everyone will have some like very meaningful interaction with at least two of the three of us. And because of that, it allows us to really still like directly um, show or like, you know, actually transfer that like culture. And like I said, I think that works for now, definitely. And I think it can still work for us growing for a while, but I think at a certain point in time, we'll have to think about how we can um, still have that, even though it's not a that direct relationship anymore. Because I imagine if we're like a thousand people, we can't necessarily yeah. keep up doing like one on ones. <laughs> like, yeah, not yeah. Doing the frequency that we currently do it. It's like I speak with most people at least like once a month or once every like one or two months. So that kind of like deeper relationship might not be as easy to maintain um but I think yeah. because we have that relationship with these relatively like early employees or early staff they can now be the ones to then also transfer that to the other people so I think um just making sure that people are finding a way to like build those relationships is what's really important in transferring the culture because it's very possible to work at a company and never speak one-on-one -on -one with anybody but and if you never do that then there's no way to actually like understand how things like what the culture is so having that sort of like one-on-one -on -one relationship is really important yeah, um, and I love that you mentioned, I mean, as the team grows bigger, it will become difficult. And this is something that I've heard um, a lot of C-suite executives say that they don't, sometimes people join the team and they don't know who it is. They just see an email pop up and they're like, oh, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so I have a new team member, right? You know, so how do you, I mean, in those moments, do you, do you feel sort of nostalgic for when the team was smaller and you knew every single person, like, and you knew their name, right? Or do you just feel like, okay, you know what? Yes, I might miss the smallest team, but this is actually a sign of growth, right? Or is it somewhere in the middle? Mm, it's definitely somewhere in the middle. And I think I feel this a lot more than my other co-founders because I haven't been back to Nigeria in such a long time. So mm. the last time I was in Nigeria, we were a team of like 10 or something. And now we're a team wow. of 50. So that means like 40 people work in this company and I don't know what their face really looks like. <laughs> and we even, I even say that specifically because we don't do a lot of video calls. We actually just, like there are people I generally don't know what their face looks like. And they don't, I mean, mm. I guess they would know what my face looks like because like they would know me, but it's just, it's just funny. And even we also have like an end of year party each year and you know we had one last year and um so all the people who are in Lagos were able to attend that and one of the things that so many people said when I was asking them about it was that like it was funny because there were so many people that like they were like oh are you this person oh are you that person you have to like ask like wait who are you exactly <laughs> but then you realize that this is somebody that you've been talking to almost every day for like, yes! months, but like you don't have that like <laughs> physical so it's definitely funny and I think for us we sort of even lean into that because because we know we're like crypto or blockchain I feel like we could even um get to a point where there's we might have an employee that we actually don't know their real identity I think that's even completely possible and we've seen this at other companies like I think maybe I don't know whether it's A16Z but I've seen this in another company where they hire somebody who's an actual anonymous person and I feel like mm. that's actually possible because like I said at the end of the day are you producing the work are you like doing the thing that we want like you're also getting something from us in being a part of our team but we don't have to physically see each other so it's kind of interesting but um it is kind of like I do sometimes get nostalgic for when we were such a small team and all our like every Friday or yeah it was like every Friday we would just like you know at the office, you know, play a few games. And like, because we were yeah. like nine, we could all just play the game together. But like now you're gonna be playing with one person, another person yeah. doing that. It's not, it's not really the same. <laughs> so it's definitely like a challenge, but I think in the future, another thing we would really like to do more is, um, you know, proper offsites where we actually have 
yeah really proper team bonding where for a few days or even up to a week we're actually like fully trying to get to know each other and I think as we grow and we're no longer really able to all have that like one-on-one relationship with everyone that kind of stuff will become really important where we actually take time out and the point of taking that time out is to just focus oh, on those yeah. relationships yeah exactly because sometimes offsite meetings happen to sort of plan a strategy for the next year or the next quarter but you're actually not bonding because you're you're still working right so yeah um so it's easy to just go back to your respective homes or countries and not have actually formed a proper like rapport with your team member or your co-worker right or even your manager um you know so that's a really good response. Okay, so we're going to move into the Q&A portion. So I, there's some questions in the Q&A box that I, I want to ask you. So I'm going to start with this one because I, I was going to ask the same. This is from Kitaka, and they're asking, what could be your take during decision-making in the company's growth stage? I actually want to ask this in a different way um, because I wanted to ask you about how you guys make decisions, right? Especially as COO and VP of engineering, right? Um, so are you guys more of a let's huddle together as founders and let's make this decision quickly or um, this is something that we want to throw open to some key members in our team and then we're going to move quickly. How do you guys approach decision making, especially in the growth phase of a company? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it really depends on what it is. There are obviously some decisions that it makes sense for only us as um, co-founders to decide on. But I would say in terms of like product decisions, we generally make it, it's a lot more open. So for example, I mentioned um, the way we do our sprints, but the at the beginning of each sprint, before we decide what we're going to do, basically everybody in the team is allowed to like pitch what they think we should work on. And it's from that pool of pitches that we then decide, okay, this makes sense to work on now, mm-hmm. this doesn't make sense to work on now. So everybody, no matter what team you're in, like whether it's like a product engineering, your customer support, your finance, anything, you're allowed to pitch what you think should um, be like to um, like determine, you know, our product direction. But obviously when the decision is about like when we when it comes to the decision of actually deciding okay like what are we going to work on then that's like a smaller group of people so it's like you know our product managers or people like leading certain teams so it's like a combination mm-hmm. um and that has i would say like obviously at the very beginning it was mostly us co-founders making those decisions but as we've grown we have you know incorporated this so that you know everyone has the opportunity to actually like have an impact on what we or what they are even working on. Yeah, I like that. A hybrid approach, I think, is the best approach to take. Um, there's another question about execution here that I, I really like as well. So Modupa is asking, what challenges you face in organizing um, an operating system for the team that powered execution? So I, I want to I ask this in a different way. So I believe that the question is really asking um, about processes and frameworks, especially tied to execution, right? Because at the end of the day, execution is a game, right? And like you said, you don't just want someone to say they're going to show up. You just want to see them show up, right? So how, what challenges did you face in actually putting together a framework or a set of processes that drive execution at Helicaria? Um, yeah, th- I think this is a good question because um, it's like a challenge that we faced because initially when you have early employees, they are the ones that are like the most like passionate about things, right? So you don't actually need to be on be on them to like do do anything, right? They're mm-hmm. just always going to like they're almost like us in found as being founders in the sense that they are very driven to just get things done. You don't need to remind them to do anything. But obviously as the company grows, there develops a bit more of a distance between like an employee working at the company and how they feel about how tied I guess they are to the organization itself so I think the way we do our sprints has changed a lot like we've had to incorporate more um like check-ins and people being like okay this is what I've worked on today like this is what I'm going to work on tomorrow that kind of thing so kind of like keep people a bit more accountable um but I think it also comes down to the culture and for us like if we see somebody who doesn't get anything done unless we like are constantly like on them for doing it then that's just not a good culture fit for us 
Okay. Okay, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, there is okay. Let me see the way. Okay, so someone's asking a question about knowing the right time to pivot a company from an original idea. So let's say the MVP, your your MVP, a new idea that has a broader that has a broader view or a new market, right? So is there is there anything as the perfect time, or do you just say, okay, we've tested for about a, a year, let's get this product to the next level or let's completely change direction and move on, move like move in a different way and change this product completely. Mm, yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the things or the biggest things that we learned from YC is that like, if you feel like something isn't working, like you should never be afraid to just kind of cut it off and change what you need to do. And um, the example they always gave us was uh, the, um, Airbnb founders, like they came into mm-hmm. YC making like cereal or something and they came out with like Airbnb. <laughs> so it's like literally just, if you see something is not working, like every second you spend like still trying to make it work is not benefiting anybody. Like you're not benefiting mm-hmm. yourself by doing that. So do not like ever be afraid to pivot. And that's also why we also really love to do MVP. So we like to, if we're, if we know there's something that we need to get out, we're always thinking, okay, what is like the most minimum, minimum, minimum thing we can get out there so that we can start getting feedback about whether it's actually worth spending any time on this. And um, we've seen this so much, like even um, with Bitcoin Africa, we probably could have gotten that out earlier or with, there are so many features that we've had that there was a way to do this like the perfect way that would have taken six months or there was a way to do it more quickly and just to kind of get it out there that would take a month and mm-hmm. we would opt for the one that would take a month and then we'll realize that the thing we were thinking that was the best way to do it that would have taken six months is actually like like nobody even wants that <laughs> so yeah you learn so much more by just getting something out there and getting that feedback and knowing whether it is a good idea or not like there's no value in an idea that just because you had it like first that doesn't make it better than something that you had later from basically learning from feedback yeah nice nice um so I, I would say that maybe there's no no such thing as a perfect time but you just kind of have to understand what's happening in the market and how you can essentially amend your product to fit what's happening in the market. Like, and which I'm sure a lot of people have to mm-hmm. do in 2020 after the lockdown, right? So people realize that, okay, maybe my product is not useful here, but might be useful in this way. Uh, so that's a really good response. Um, okay, so someone here has a question. About, okay, this is an interesting one. Um, and I don't know how involved you are in, you know, PR around Helicaria, but this is a question on how do you notify your team after you do a press release or a PR agency does several articles on behalf of the company? So I guess is this, whenever you guys are about to do, I guess, big press announcement, is, do you tell the entire team before or do you just wait until after it goes out and then you say, okay, this is what's going on and this is what this announcement means? Uh, okay. Um, I don't think there's ever, at least from my memory anyway, there's ever been something that we have announced that like the team didn't know about before. So I think maybe it's because of the way we work in terms of like, when we start the new sprint, everybody knows what is being worked on, right? So everybody knows like, what something will eventually happen, right? Um, so it shouldn't ever be a surprise that, oh, we've launched like our desk, for example, like everybody knew we were working on it and we are going to launch it. So it was not going to mm-hmm. be a surprise to anybody on the team. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's anything that has been like an important announcement that we've made that the team wasn't notified about internally beforehand. Okay, thank you. Um, Joshua has a question about how um, it seems as though new roles are being published are uh, senior roles or managerial roles, which makes it harder for first timers, especially people who are trying to transition into tech, makes it harder for them to get into the ecosystem. Do you think that this is a prevalent issue that needs to be addressed? And do more startups, especially as they're transitioning out of um, seed to scale up, um, do they need to, I guess, create more roles for interns, for interns, associates, you know, just people who are just trying to get their leg in, but may not have like 
three, four, five years of experience, you know. Mm. Yeah, this is definitely um, an issue that like I see. And um, I do agree that like companies should do actually hire more for those types of roles. And that's why we even have like an internship program where um, focused around women who want to get into this space. So um, we kind of like, you know, take on certain women and, you know, they go through like either front end or back end or a combination of both. And um, they kind of move up through there. And we have people working in the company who have come in through this internship program and are now progressing to senior levels. I think there is a bit of a um, balance to be struck in that, you know, at the end of the day, you still a company. So you need to be able to make sure that even if you are taking on interns or people who are at a lower level that you're still able to meet whatever targets that you have so I understand the difficulty that companies might face around doing that but there is a way to do it and I think that um, particularly like in the space that we're in in the sense that like it is even difficult to find a lot of people at those senior managerial roles so the only way to get somebody at that role is to actually like you know train them to get to that role so it is definitely difficult, and I agree that more companies could um, be more um, intentional about trying to hire at those lower levels. Yeah, I mean, there's, I don't think you, you really have a lot of control over that, especially when your company is going into the growth stage, right? Because one thing I've noticed, and I've seen this across the board, even with um, uh, companies that have gone on to raise Series C, Series D, is that as they grow larger, they want to hire highly skilled people because your early employees are usually generalists, right? Eventually, some of them become skilled at a specific thing, but you don't want to risk bringing in more generalists when you are in your scale-up stage because you can afford to, like, you need people who know what they're doing well to help take the company to the next level. And then maybe after that, you can then set up a program for um, newer entrants to sort of support their growth. Um, but yeah, I think it's a bit tricky there. Okay, um, so somebody has a question about hiring um, and they're asking, like, do you, do you guys uh, use headhunters? Do you use recruiters or I guess referrals? Or do you actually just put out the position and sort of have to go through the process of going through CVs and reading responses and things like that? Yeah, so I would say it's a combination, but I would say it's actually mostly um, just putting things out there and seeing whatever we receive, whatever application we receive and going through that. I would say that's how most of the people that we've hired have come from. Um, but we do take, you know, referrals. I, I think that's also a really valuable way of getting people, especially if somebody within the company refers somebody else. I think that um, helps a lot because that at least shows that the person being referred will at least align on certain like, you know, culture things. But yeah, I think just definitely mm -hmm. a combination. Okay, combination, I think that works as well for most companies. And then the final question in our Q&A before I move to audience questions is um, someone asking your strategy in approaching the market. What is your strategy? I'm not sure, this is an anonymous question, so I don't know what you mean by approaching the market. But the second part of their question is, um, where at the time you were building Bitcoin Africa, and I would even say up until buy coins, were you talking to investors while you were building the product or were you approached after, especially after YC, were you approached, were you approached by investors? Um, yeah, I'll ask the second question first. So when we were building the very first version, um, we weren't really like actively speaking to investors, like like I said, we kind of wanted to get something out there before we started um, fundraising so fully. Um, but obviously once you get into YC, then fundraising becomes a lot more active. But at that point, we also had a product. So we weren't fundraising off the back of an idea. We're fundraising with like a working product that was out there. Um, and for the first question, which was about strategy in approaching the markets. Um, I think I would kind of go back to what I said about if we think that there's something that we need to get out there, just getting feedback from users as early as possible. And that's kind of how we know whether something is going to actually be product market fits because we have to like actually get the 
market to tell us whether mm -hmm. what we've built works or not. So yeah. I would say like a big thing for us is getting feedback from the markets and that really informs our product decisions. Okay, thank you. I hope that, I, I hope people's questions were answered. Um, I'm, a few more are coming in, but I, I want to ask some of the questions that we got in from, from our audience members who registered for the event. So first, we've got two very interesting personal questions. The first one is, what was your dream job growing up? <laughs> um, Do you remember? <laughs> I feel like I don't at all because I think that's also why I struggled a lot, like picking what I was going to study at university. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think I ever had like, oh, when I grow up, I want to be this or that. So when I was about to go to university, I picked psychology because that was just my favorite subject at the time. And I didn't want to be a psychologist. <laughs> I don't want to like, so there was literally no, I think the only phase I had where I was like, oh, I want to be this was when I thought I was going to be a surgeon, but that was basically like from Grey's Anatomy. So I don't think it was like really well thought out. I just saw their life and I was like, I think I could do this. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't think I ever really had that old dream job or anything <laughs> like i can imagine you in uni for like eight years trying to be a surgeon like that's a yeah and that years. really quickly <laughs> like i thought about it and then i really was like am i going to be at university for like and eight years is just like almost the minimum right <laughs> so I was like, no no i can't i can't <laughs> So we're going to say we're going to say surgeon inspired by Grizzly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the second one is about money being your day, which I'm actually interested in, right? And um, so, for example, when Jack Dorsey was still CEO at Twitter and also Square, he talked about breaking down his day. So Monday was management, Tuesday was this, Wednesday was that, right? So obviously, you sort of wear two hats, right? So what does your work day look like? How do you sort of mm. plan? And you know what 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 matters to you, for example, like break times, right? Is there a time where you just say I have stopped working and I'm gonna just focus on personal things, you know, so things like that. Mm. Yeah, I definitely face this a lot because even outside Heli Carrier, I have a lot of other like work that I still need to make time for. So for example, right now I'm working on a tech talk and I have to like then change that balance like for this week I'm more focused on this talk and I just kind of do a lot of the you know more urgent mm -hmm. or things that need to be done but outside of that I'm like okay I need to focus on this but I would say like I don't really have a day-to-day -day schedule but what I do is that I make sure there are certain days so like the way I do it is Wednesdays and generally Fridays where I block that off as no like heli carrier meetings and if possible no meetings at all so i can actually just focus on getting things done and then when i'm you know at the start of the week trying to think about okay what am i going to work on this week then i can now say okay during that like wednesday and friday where am i going to slot in all the other things that i need to do and then um obviously also like on Mondays or something, I will also look at like, okay, what heli carrier stuff do I need to get done this week? But I think the way I kind of just approach my actual day is I like some flexibility to it. So I don't do calendar blocking or anything like that where I'm saying mm -hmm. from this time to this time, I must work on this. I just have more of a goal for that day. And then, you know, I, I think I'm most productive in the morning. So I try also not to have too many meetings in actual mornings. I try to just... Yeah. If I have to have a meeting, I'll do it like in the afternoon so that I can actually spend the mornings actually like getting work accomplished. Yeah, I think that's important. Knowing when you work best and trying not to schedule meetings around or around those hours. And we also implemented a new meeting day uh, once a week at BCM. And it is amazing because we all look forward to that day, <laughs> knowing that. Yeah. You're not going to be in a meeting, even if it's only yeah. one, you know, it's, it's, I would try. Exactly. Death, it's it. funny yeah. that like everybody, I don't think anybody likes meetings, but everybody has so many no. meetings. Yeah. I don't understand how <laughs> this happens <laughs> because everybody realizes like, even if I have one 15 minute meeting on a Wednesday, like it, I feel like it just derails my whole day because I'm just like, yes. I have to plan around it. So I, it's just yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We've gotten sucked into it, even though we don't like it, right? So I, I would say yeah. that to founders on the call, 
I'm, I'm telling you, your team members will love you if you just implement one day where you don't have any meetings because exactly. that gives one, your right? team members. Yeah. Just one day. It gives them, trust me, gives them time to actually plan. And it's better if it's at the start of the week. Um, so they know that, okay, like, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I, I can plan and all of that, you know. Uh, so that's a really, really good response. Um, okay, so there's there's a section, there's, we have some questions on that building a startup, right? And one question is around securing funding for an early stage startup that's still working on an MVP. And I kind of want you to answer this from your perspective as an angel investor, because we know you've invested in a couple of really early stage startups, right? So what is your own approach in, in funding these companies, right? What, are, what is it that you look out for? And perhaps founders who are running early stage startups can know also how to put their best foot forward when they're looking for investment. Um, so did you specifically say prior to having an MVP? No, the question, I think it's, um, so they said, no, they are working on the MVP, not actually ready yet. It's just still in uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's difficult because for me personally, I like to see that there's something created, right? Rather, like, I don't know, I think it's a bit difficult because like, it's definitely difficult based on what you're working on to have that MVP. But I think being able to get to MVP tells me a lot about the person actually, right? So I think it shows that, you know, you're going to be able to, um, I, I think it shows drive. It shows that you're able to actually like problem solve to the point where before being able to have much funding, you're able to actually get something out there. So for me, I think it is a huge factor to have something before you start fundraising, or at least from me. I feel like I don't think I would um, invest in something that is pre-MVP. So it is definitely like a balance to be struck. And I think even um, one of the reasons that we probably didn't get into YC the first time was that we launched the day that we applied, right? So we showed that there was something to be built, but we hadn't necessarily shown um, that, you know, we're going to kind of keep up with it. We haven't necessarily shown that like it is something that anybody really wants. So I think it is really important to get to that point. But I think um, it also really depends on the situation they're in, because I think for some products, you actually, you just ultimately need some money. And not everybody has yeah. the privilege of being able to do like a quote unquote friends and family round. And if you're not really able to do that, then um, there's almost like nothing else you can do besides like just try to raise. But I would just say that like those are maybe a bit rarer circumstances where your company that are trying to build absolutely needs something. And there's no way that you can actually build any form of NVP without um without some sort of capital and um yeah that, that's kind of what i would say oh i i'm i'm that whoever has that question was on the call and they heard that response which is pretty great um so the next section before we actually before i actually ask this question um we're gonna put out a poll um bully sorry i just realized i'd asked one question before that so a poll is gonna pop up on your screen shortly everyone um who's listening in please fill it out it, it just helps us with making um, event better. So these, these um, questions are actually based on the conversation. So we're, we're testing if you're actually listening to us or if we're just <laughs> looking at our faces. <laughs> so please answer the question. I was wondering why I can't there. fill out this form. Why can't I fill out this Sorry, form? no, you can't fill it. That's cheating because you already know the answer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, but please DM Eric for Expo because she might help you out. But please I won't help anybody. <laughs> You know, and, and there are only four questions, but we can, um, I can ask you the next question while people are filling that out. Um, so there's a question about knowing when you need to have more developers on your team, right? Or more engineers on your team. At what point do you realize that, okay, um, <laughs> Timmy said, Ira, what's the answer? <laughs> Please tell me. Um, yeah, on your own. So yeah. <laughs> So at what point do you know that, okay, our engineering team needs more support or we need to bring in um, extra hands, right? Uh, you know, do you wait until like the team is like, oh, we need help or is it something that you get assessed at a leadership level? Yeah, so I would say earlier on, it was more about, okay, well, getting to the point where like 
or I guess almost the breaking points when we're extremely early on, right? We're like, okay, we need somebody to do this. We need somebody to do that. But I think for us, the switch really needed to happen to be like, okay, we don't need to operate in like, oh, um, almost danger mode or survival mode in the sense that, oh, only when we're almost dying, are we going to like add somebody mm-hmm. else? It, we had to then switch to be, um, okay, well, actually we're, you know, this is a relatively established um, company. And even though we are still like a startup, we're still, you know, wanting people to be very resourceful. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't like be a bit more like um, have a bit more like forethought or foresight in yeah. what we're doing. So now we're a lot more like every, I don't know, a couple of months or something, we're like assessing to know, okay, what are we actually going to be building for the next um couple of months and are we able to achieve this with who we currently have or is it going to get to the point where it's going to start to feel like we're reaching that breaking point so let's actually preemptively start hiring and another reason we even had to switch to this way of doing things was because um the process of hiring just takes so long so if we were going to wait up until the point where we're like breaking and we need somebody we have to recognize that it's going to take at least like one or two months to actually get a person yeah. so that's why we have to like revisit and be like okay no actually let's start the process before we actually need the person very true very true um so there's a question about how you maintain the co- like quality of work and consistency especially when you're running operations right so what are some things that you just like there are no news you know once you see them you flag it and you're like okay if we don't address this issue then we could see the quality of work drop in right and um, I guess you guys have any um, any safeguards against low quality work right you know and what does that look like for your team um well I, I would say two things come to mind so the first thing is obviously like everything is reviewed so particularly like on the engineering or product side like nothing goes out to users that hasn't been reviewed by like you know a few Mm -hmm. different people so nothing really makes it out that like we are unhappy with and I think it's also that review process that lets us catch whether um we feel like somebody isn't doing something up to scratch and um that's something that we're always like on the lookout for so if it feels like okay this person is consistently not really doing what we think that they should be doing and that's kind of like a red flag for us um the other thing that comes to mind is just like communication so going back again to the whole thing about like you know having trust in our like employees to actually um do the work instead of us having to like chase them up to do it yeah um we are very like we put a very big um emphasis and importance on proactive communication so what we really don't like is if somebody just kind of like doesn't really do a task and then they kind of wait for somebody else to ask them about it before they say oh the reason they didn't do this was because of x y and z like for us that's like not acceptable at all so what's acceptable acceptable is to say that oh today I am realizing that I'm not going to be able to achieve these tasks that have been set out to me for x y and z reasons so I'm going to have to change the deadlines in this way but what's not acceptable is the other way around so um that's something that we really like drilled into people and that's like something we don't really have any tolerance for because with all the you know trust and all the communication that we do we expect to definitely get that back yeah yeah absolutely or something oh okay um so there's a question here which i'm you know really interested in learning and this is about motivating your employees right and i'm interested in this because um i mean anyone who lives in nigeria kind of knows that we're dealing with a lot of issues power fuel scarcity all of these things right and we're speaking internally as a team like how do we motivate our employees despite the challenges they're facing, right? So talk to us about like 2020, right? Because a lot of companies experience challenges with motivating their team members when everyone had to go remote, right? This was when the world was shut down, right? So can you talk to us about like how you guys were able to overcome these challenges in 2020? And if you're still seeing those challenges now, or if you guys are motivating your team members in a different way? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, 
ultimately for us, what really helped was ha having people be aligned in the vision. So in that sense, COVID was actually like one of the things that might have helped or showed people the vision because a lot of people faced a lot of like financial issues and a lot of people began to see the value and importance in cryptocurrency. So I think people working on something that they really believed was making a difference definitely helped a lot with that motivation. But we're also very like, you know, sensitive to people needing, you know, like mental health um, support or somebody is just not having a great like mental, a great period for their mental health. That's something that like, you know, we're very understanding of. And um, if people need to, you know, take breaks because of that, that's something that, you know, we are completely fine with. Like I said, it's very much about communication. And if someone is feeling that lack of motivation due to just the circumstances around them, that's something that we try to be very understanding of and not, like that doesn't mean that the person is just being like lazy or something, like there's a reason mm -hmm. for it. And it's something that, you know, can be addressed. And um, we also try to do whatever we can to take out the, or like shields, I guess is maybe the best way to put it. Shields are like staff from the Nigeria, Nigerianess. <laughs> so, yeah. um, like I said, by, you know, um, paying them in a dollar pegged um, stable coin helps a lot, but we also have um, stipends for people's like internet and even for like their food. So we are trying to like remove the hassle of, I guess, day-to-day -day life in Nigeria by giving them the extra funds so that they can actually just, you know, have a subscription in Eden, for example, and not have to like worry about food every day and, you know, just have, buy whatever internet package that they need to do, particularly like with working from home. So those are some of the things that we try to do, but it is like very difficult. And I think that um, as a company, we also need to be, or as companies in general, we need to be aware that, you know, we're working with actual people and nobody is like a robot that's just going to be consistently the same all the time. People are going to have like ups and downs and um, we need to like understand that. Yeah, very good point. Um, so we're coming to towards the close, towards the end of the conversation. There are just a few more questions um, in the chat box that we're gonna ask. Um, so there's a question here about how you expand your team, but I have a feeling you kind of already covered that when you were speaking about recruiting. So I don't know if there's any more you want to add to that question about expanding your team. Is there any extra thoughts um, you want to add yet? Yeah, not really. I think um, I've kind of covered like, you know, the process that we go through in actually getting people and then like the interviewing process and, you know, culture and things like that. Yeah, okay, so I've already answered this. Okay, so there's a question here about um, the adoption of blockchain technology on financial sectors. Um, is this something that you can speak into? Um, how, I guess, non-fintech or non-financial services operators can also adopt blockchain technology? Do you know about any opportunities that mm -hmm. exist in that space? Yeah. Um, so I think, I guess the way I understand this is about like, I guess, using the blockchain for other mm -hmm. things besides yes, just other like things apart from, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, to be honest, it's still such like a it's brand new. new space. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody really has come up with what, what other like actual practical applications of blockchain that are going to be besides like cryptocurrencies. Um, there is definitely the potential for other things. Like I've seen people think about, okay, maybe we can use it to, for like, you know, re government registries. So stuff like, oh, the land registry could be on the blockchain instead of being in like a box of papers in some like filing cabinet or something. Yeah. <laughs> but there's definitely like applications for it. It's just that um, we haven't really seen those yet. So it's really up for anybody to um, be the one to, you know, try out different things and maybe come up with what that like killer blockchain application is going to be. Okay, thank you. And then the final question is, um, so Clement is asking if Helicara has, uh, has a human resources team that manages, or is it just something that um, the founding team does together? 
Um, I mean, HR is sort of part of like operations. So that's something that I'm, I'm also like very involved in, but we do have like, you know, an HR manager that deals with um, a lot of the logistics around the managing people. But like I said, I think the managing of the culture is more what comes from us as founders. Okay, great. So that is the end. Thank you so much, Ira. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to sh share? our audience um before we um, close out um i don't know use buy coins use send cash use anything <laughs> <laughs> go and buy bitcoin yeah buy coins. <laughs> go, go buy some cryptocurrency and buy coins please and support yeah. business. thank you <laughs> thanks everyone for joining us thank you eric Karina. well we have a service we've just shared um that out it just helps us make this event better our next and final episode of building from ground up will take place on friday march 25th that's next week friday and it's with k akiwumi co-founder and ceo of zazu a cross-border fintech um, thank you to uk nigeria tech hub for powering the building from ground up series thank you to tc insights for organizing this event putting it together and implementing it as well, TC Insights or Tech About Insights is Tech About Data Research and Intelligence Units, which provide actionable data at, of startups and the tech ecosystem across Africa to investors, entrepreneurs, big tech companies, pretty much anyone who is interested in understanding the data behind a lot of what's going on in the industry, funding, valuations, all of these things. TC Insights plays a huge role in putting that information together and publishing it on our website. Um, we also have a couple of newsletters. We have TC Daily, which goes out every weekday morning at 7 a.m. And we have a newsletter called The Next Wave, which is more of a futuristic take on what's happening in the ecosystem and where the ecosystem stands to be in five years and 10 years. And that goes out every Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. Um, everyone who is on this call hosts um, Tech Abal. Everyone moderator is on LinkedIn, UK Nigeria Tech Hub. So if you'd like to keep up to date with what's happening with Tech Abal, with Telecarrier, with ERA, um, with UK and Nigeria Tech Hub, please follow us on LinkedIn and you know, we'll pull up that information there. Um, there were some links that were shared in the chat, ERA's um, blog, um, a couple of other articles as well that we, we might find interesting, that you might find interesting. Please check the chat box and you know, enjoy yourself. Thank you again, everyone. And um, in case you missed it, Big Cabal Media, which is our parent company, raised some seed funding. We announced that yesterday. So Dam Larry, please share the article to our fundraise in the chat box. Um, and so you guys can sort of catch up with Bikabal Media. Um, Tech about is a publication under Bikabal Media and so is the Coco as well. So if you'd like to learn more about what we're building as a Pan-African media company, please read that article. And that's it for me. Have a wonderful day, everyone. <laughs>